Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. My husband, the engineer, who's been sucked into being my AV guy, says we should be good to go. If you have any issues as we're going through this, um, go ahead and just type in the chat, and he's monitoring that, and so we'll kind of figure that out as we go. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Devin. I used to coach lacrosse, and now mostly I officiate lacrosse. I've spent the past almost 30 years working in higher ed, and I've spent a lot of time on admissions committees. So I'd like to help the girls kind of figure out that process and navigate through it so they can find the right college and hopefully have a successful application. Um, ASU's system is the one we're using for Zoom. It's a little odd where depending on the size of the group, sometimes it will allow you to unmute yourself to ask questions and sometimes it won't. So if you can unmute to ask a question, go ahead. If you can't, again, just use the chat box. Um, we're monitoring that and we can um, answer your questions if you need. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started with the first slide of our presentation to kind of get going. So we're gonna cover a few things tonight and then we'll have other workshops that um, cover more aspects of the recruiting process in detail, but um, we're going to look at how we can research colleges to find the right fit, um, building a recruiting profile so that you also get the attention of college coaches, um, communicating with coaches, how the NCAA registration process works, testing, um, the common application, um, a little bit about FAFSA and college funding, but we'll have a whole other workshop that really talks about financial aid, which is kind of its own ugly animal. And then um, we'll just kind of start here with researching colleges. And those of you who pre-registered for this workshop, you should have some handouts that were emailed to you with the Zoom link. Um, if you came in um, late from getting the Zoom link and haven't registered at some point, um, you know, in the next day or two, just go to southmountainlax.com and click on the college prep link and you can register for this workshop and I'll have your email that I can then send you the handouts. So don't worry about that. We can get those to you if you don't have them yet. Um, one of the best ways to research colleges is to go to the college websites. A lot of them have um, virtual tours now because of COVID. So that's a really good option. Um, when COVID kind of dies down as time and money allows, there's really no substitute for visiting a campus if that's something that you're interested in. Um, it, it's really rough to pick a college and know you've made the right choice if you've never visited the institution, uh, especially if you're looking at schools that are really far away from where you live. Um, because you just have no idea what to expect. But virtual tours, at least for now, can give you a pretty good idea of what the school is like and the culture, the size, those kinds of things. Um, NCSA and other recruiting services are pretty good, and I'll show you some um, slides in a little bit that kind of give you examples of what they'll show you um, about colleges. But NCSA is the um, official partner of U.S. Lacrosse for recruiting. Um, there's also Connect Lax, which is the official partner of the WPLL. There's Sports Recruits, there's Captain U. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a little bit, but um, they all are pretty good and they do very similar things. Um, but for every one of them, they all have a lot of college information built into the sites that you can use to kind of get a sense of what the colleges are like. Um, Spark Consulting is an interesting one. They used to do a lot of work and they had a lot of free research available online for all kinds of colleges as well as their athletic programs. Now they pretty much focus exclusively on coxswains, um, rowing folks. So it's, um, they have less information than they used to because they're focusing now mostly on um, colleges and universities that have rowing programs. That having been said, um, 
I'll show you a slide with some of the stuff they do have that is phenomenal, the work that they do. So if you have interest in colleges that also happen to have rowing programs, um, you can go to their site for free and look up a whole lot of information about those colleges. Um, they tend not to keep information anymore on schools that don't have rowing programs though. So if you're interested in a college that doesn't have a rowing team, then Spark Consulting won't help you. But, but if your college of interest has both lacrosse and rowing, um, their information is fantastic. Um, you can look at college rankings. I will say this though, as someone who has worked at a lot of different colleges and universities over the years, you will get out of college what you put into it. Um, and some colleges are really highly ranked in general but you might be interested in a program that that school is not very good at. So I would take the college rankings with a grain of salt, um, especially because a lot of institutions that rank colleges, one of the things they rank on is the size of their endowment, which is essentially um, how wealthy their alumni are and how much money they donate, which doesn't necessarily guarantee a better education. It just means the school has a whole lot more money sitting invested. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. The college rankings often get way too much um, attention, and that's not necessarily the best way to find a school. Um, guidance counselors are a really good resource because they can help you um, learn about different schools that are good with different programs that you might be interested in. So schools that are really good with nursing programs are not necessarily the same schools that have phenomenal engineering programs or excellent fine arts programs, those kinds of things. So you really kind of need to consider what, what you're interested in. Um, here in Arizona, um, ASU's engineering program is much more highly ranked than any other engineering program in the state. It's not even close. But um, if a student was interested in fine arts, particularly dance, um, I hate to admit this as an ASU alumni and employee, but U of A has a way better dance program than ASU ever has. Um, it's, it's sadly true, I'll deny it later. But um, so for students who are interested in something like that, it, you know, ASU is not the right choice for them. It, you know. Um, there are other options for researching schools. There are a lot of um, sites that look at colleges by affordability, by tuition. There's a really good one, if we have time at the end, we'll pull up it. Um, they actually do something really interesting. Georgetown University has a um, Center for Education and Workforce Development and they built this huge website that actually looks at the cost of college and then the rate of graduation and what the average graduate makes when they graduate over time. And they actually calculate the current, present, and future values of, um, of that particular education at that school. And the data are really surprising um, in terms of which schools are uh, more affordable over the long run and a better value than others. And that's a really great resource. Um, to make sure that what money you're putting into college, you're likely to get back career-wise over the years. Okay, so things to consider when you're looking at a college. Um, which of these factors will be most important to you is really going to depend on each individual student. But I, I think certainly for students and for parents, um, especially if parents are putting in any funding for their kids. Retention rates are really important. Some schools, um, the retention rate from freshman to sophomore year is 90 to 95%. Other schools, the retention rate from freshman to sophomore year is 60%. Um, and that's really not a good sign. If your institution can't keep students, um, that's a problem. Transferring is always a pain, credits are weird, you have to align all the curriculum. It's very difficult for students. Um, so going to a school that can't retain students is kind of a problem. It suggests that you might not be happy, that there might be some issues with the school. So retention rates are really important. If you're interested in playing lacrosse in college, um, 
schools will also report retention rates for the student body as a whole, as well as for athletes. So that's kind of another thing that you can look at. If the school you're most interested in has a 90% retention rate, but the retention rate for athletes is 72%, um, that would suggest that the school does not provide much in the way of support for athletes to help keep them engaged academically and eligible, and that might be an issue. So if your school's retention rate for the general student body and for athletes is pretty similar, and it's reasonably high, that's a good sign. Um, so that's something certainly to consider, because if you're putting a lot of money, if you're going away to school, you really want a school that keeps students um, location and size is important. So for some kids, if you absolutely hate cold weather, um, schools in Chicago, it doesn't matter how good they are, it's not the right choice for you. Um, if you want to stay close to home, then you have to kind of decide, does close to home mean within 100 miles, within 250 miles, within 500 miles? Some kids want to get as far away from home as possible and that's okay too, but kind of really consider what location the school is in and what you're interested in. Um, the size of the school uh, is something that a lot of kids really care about. Um, size though is sort of a relative thing that you really want to think about as you're looking at schools. So for example, all of the Claremont colleges are fairly small. So they're kind of an interesting, um, for those of you who don't know much about them, they're kind of an interesting setup. Every one of the Claremont colleges is a small liberal arts college, but they're a partnership. So there's Claremont McKenna, there's Scripps, there's Pomona, there's Pitzer, there's Harvey Mudd, those are the five undergrad institutions. And then there are two graduate institutions that are part of the Claremont colleges. So there's seven total. Every one of them has fewer than 2000 students but combined, they're close to 10,000 students. Um, as an undergraduate population, they have as many students as Stanford. Um, and their colleges, all seven of them, are built right next to each other. So it's seven different college campuses, but they're all connected right next to each other. So if you're thinking, oh, I don't wanna go to a school that only has 1,300 students, well, one of those Claremont schools if you go there, it doesn't feel like a school of 1,300 students. It feels like a school of 10,000 students because of all the undergrad and graduate students at those seven institutions. Um, so kind of consider those sorts of things too. Uh, it's not the same as a 1,300 student liberal arts college kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, also, those Claremont schools, they're in Pomona, California. So they're in the middle of the LA metro area. So it feels a little different also if you're going to a school there than again, if you're going to a small liberal arts college that's really kind of out there in a rural area. So those are things to consider too. Um, rural schools will feel smaller. Schools that are more urban or suburban won't feel as small. Um, the type of school and selectivity is gonna be really important. So do you want to go to a liberal arts college that lets you pick your own major and if they don't have a major you like, you can create your own major because there are a number of schools that will do that. Do you want to go to a school that is really strongly engineering like Embry-Riddle Aeronautical Institute or something like that? Um, so those kinds of things matter. Um, do you want to go to a private institution? Do you want to go to a large public institution? So for a lot of kids that matters. Um, and how selective is the school? Um, there are schools that are academically pretty open, and there are schools that are really highly selective, and there are schools everywhere in between. And for athletes, D1, D2, D3 doesn't matter. There are really selective schools in all of those areas, and then there are schools that are not very selective in all of those areas. Um, what kind of majors are offered? That's probably one of the most important things that most students should consider. If schools you're interested in because they have great lacrosse teams don't have a major you're interested in, you're gonna be miserable, you're wasting your time. Um, really look 
where is the school? What kinds of majors do they have? And are these majors of interest to you? Because if you can't study something that you like, um, that will interest you, that you can get a job later, have a career, um, it's, you're going to spend a lot of money and either be miserable or end up leaving that institution for somewhere else. Um, so really consider what majors do they offer. Um, research options. If you don't care about research, then who cares if that's an option for you. But if you're interested in things like graduate school, um, if you know that you want to go to medical school, something like that, you want to look at will these schools allow you to do research as an undergraduate? Because that really helps with your medical school application. It makes you much more likely to get into graduate school. So those kinds of things matter for some students. So if you're one of those students that's looking at graduate school, you want to look at what are the research options. And don't automatically assume that large public research institutions or private research institutions are the only places where you can actually do research. Um, there are a lot of small liberal arts colleges that have phenomenal research programs that their undergraduates participate in. Um, other things, does the school offer internships? Do they have a lot of partners where you can go out and try different careers? Um, do they offer study abroad? If you're going to participate in athletics at the school, will the athletic team allow you to participate in study abroad or will they not? And for different schools, the answer is different. Most of the D3 schools, um, because they're so academics focused, most will allow athletes to participate and study abroad. Um, that doesn't mean D1 and D2 programs won't. Some do and some don't, depending on the time of year and the sport you play. But those are things you want to look at. If you're interested in those kinds of programs, does the school have that opportunity? Is it included in the cost of tuition? And will the athletic team allow you to participate? Um, you kind of want to look at housing and dining options. Um, housing, a lot of people think about, are you required to live on campus? Is there a lot of off-campus housing? What's the expense? Um, you know, those sorts of things. But dining, a lot of people, a lot of students don't really think about till they get to a campus. But it is something, if you have any kind of allergies, if you're vegetarian or vegan, those kinds of things, it, it's something you want to look at what kinds of dining options and what sort of variety is available on campus because the last thing you want is to pick a school that has one dining hall and no real specificity depending on a student's dietary needs. Uh, that can be a really miserable time for students trying to figure out what the heck they're going to eat. Um, other kinds of extra extracurricular activities and sports. Um, are you going to play lacrosse or are you not? Whether you're playing lacrosse or not, are there other activities at the school that interest you? Um, for some students, they're just going to play lacrosse and study. For other students, other activities are really important. So if other activities are important to you, that's something you want to look at. Uh, safety. All the colleges and universities have to report their safety data. So it's publicly available on their website. Um, you can also go to the US Department of Education and find that data, but that is something students should look at and parents probably definitely want to look at um, how safe is that campus. Um, and, and again, all that data has to be reported. And then there's the cost. And what I will say about cost, and again, in a few weeks when we do the financial aid workshop, we'll talk a lot more about the actual cost of college. But Every college or university you look at, if you go to their website, they will tell you what their tuition is. But what they're telling you is their full total tuition. Um, you can look around on the website and many of them will tell you whether or not they will meet 100% of financial need or not um, and, and how they kind of work it out. But at most colleges and universities, Many students don't even come close to paying the actual posted full tuition and fees. 
a lot of students get some form of financial aid, whether it be athletic, whether it be merit money for academics, need-based aid, those kinds of things. And so um, particularly at very expensive institutions, I'll use Stanford as an example, most students don't even come close to paying the full tuition and fees at Stanford because most students couldn't afford to pay the full tuition and fees at Stanford. Um, so when you look at the cost, that full tuition and fees is not necessarily what you would be paying. So kind of take that with a grain of salt and we'll, we'll kind of move on and talk a little bit more about that when some other slides come up. But here, this is a slide from the Spark Consulting folks I mentioned. Um, and so you can see they have a ton of information. This is Stanford um, data from a year ago. So you can see the size of the school, you can see what their graduation rates are, um, all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of data available where you can kind of learn about the college. Um, they even put things like what the ACT and SAT midpoints are and what they mean by midpoint is median. So half the students score higher than that and half score lower. Um, at an institution like Stanford, the half that score lower don't score very much lower. All their students tend to have very high test scores that get admitted. But you can look at sites like this and see, and again, this one was the Sparks Consulting that now focuses on rowing. And we'll go to the next slide and you can see some lacrosse data from back when they were still publishing that. But here you can kind of see, um, they'll tell you about the division in the conference, but they'll also tell you um, where you can see what the graduation rate is of their athletes relative to the rest of the population. Um, they do some interesting things where they'll also give you data about positions and some stats about their average player, which can be helpful if you're looking at a particular institution and you really want to play sports. Now, interestingly enough, pretty much everyone on the field at Stanford, they, they average five foot seven, I think it was. Um, they tend to have taller than average girls on the team. That doesn't mean if you're five foot two, you have no shot at playing at Stanford, but um, you can kind of get a sense of what type of player they're looking at for some of this data. Um, and we'll go to the, Next slide, um, and you can kind of see this is a slide from NCSA, and that's one of the recruiting profile options. And NCSA has information about pretty much every college and university in the country that has sports teams. Um, and so here you can see we're on a screen where you can see their division one, you can see they're a private institution, they're classified as suburban, um, you can see that academically, they're one of the most selective institutions, that they're also very competitive athletically. Um, you can see the tuition data that um, a lot of these recruiting services have tend to be a little bit out of date. So um, this was pulled today for Stanford, and they're saying tuition is 49.6. They're over 66,000 today. Um, so there's always a little bit of lag before the current data gets into these recruiting profiles. But again, um, I believe right now at, at tuition that's slightly higher than 66,000 a year, the average Stanford student is only paying about 17,000 a year in tuition because of all the financial aid that they get. So again, that's kind of one of those things to keep in mind. Um, the tuition that's posted again is not necessarily what you pay. So this is kind of what it looks like for NCSA. Um, this is just a screenshot, but if you go into NCSA, you can click on some of the other tabs that you'll see at the top um, and you can look at other things about the college. And we'll go to Connect Lax and you can see, so this is from another recruiting service, Connect Lax, and you can see, so we're gonna just do Stanford across the board because pretty much everyone has heard of Stanford and and then you can kind of compare what the different uh, recruiting services will show you. But, but they'll also give you information about the size, about the cost, about how selective they are, all of those kinds of things. And again, in their case, they've got a menu on the left where you can click and get more information about other things. And then Sports Recruits is the next one. And they do similar stuff. It just looks different in this case. 
you can kind of scroll down um, once you're in the sports recruit site and see other things about the school. But all of these recruiting profile, recruiting services will tell you basically the size of the school, what the tuition is roughly, um, how selective they are academically and athletically. They'll tell you um, often things like graduation rate, are they classified as rural, urban, suburban, all of those kinds of things. So you can get a good idea about a school, even if you've never been there and have more of a sense of, do you want to consider this school or do you not want to consider this school? Um, right now in the US, there's about 4,500 colleges and universities. And so um, it's kind of a quick way to start narrowing things down because no one can sit there and research all of those institutions. So you kind of need a quick way to separate schools and figure out what you want. And then after you've done some research, whether it's talking to your guidance counselor, going to these recruiting services, looking at Spark Consulting, US News Rankings, all those kinds of things, looking at the college websites, um, talk to friends and family. Where did they go? How happy they were? Once you've kind of done all that research and you have a whole bunch of schools you've looked at, you want to start compiling a list. Eventually, you want to get down to about 10 schools. Most kids today apply to 10, 15 schools um, in the end when it's time for them to apply to colleges. Some go nuts and apply to 30 or 40 schools. I don't really recommend it. Um, you have to pay application fees unless you get um, waivers, financial aid waivers for that. But every student is paying for every application. So the more schools you apply for, the more expensive it is. Um, and there's really no point applying to a school where you're not going to be happy, you know. Um, but in the end, when you want to get down to a list of about 10 schools, you kind of want to break it down this way. Um, you want some reach schools. And if you're, whether you're playing sports or not, this is kind of the list you want. Um, if you're an athlete, a reach school could be a reach athletically or academically or both. Um, a reach school is, like the slide says, any school that accepts less than 15% of their applicants. Um, so you could have a 4.0 GPA and a 1580 out of 1600 on your SATs and Stanford is still a REACH institution for you because it's a REACH institution for everyone. Harvard is a REACH institution for everyone. Michigan is an excellent public school. It's a REACH institution for everyone. Um, they're that good. Their acceptance rates are that low. That's just the way it is. So there will be certain schools that are REACH schools for everyone. Um, for you as a student in particular, if your GPA and test scores are around the 20th percentile of admits, which again, the schools post publicly their admissions data. Um, so if you're in around the 25th percentile of admits, it's a reach school for you. Target schools, you want a few more target schools than reach schools. Those are schools where your GPA and test scores are around the 50th percentile of kids that have been previously admitted. So that lets you know you're really right there in the middle of what they take. So that's a target school for you, and that's a school that you are likely to be accepted to. Um, safety schools, it's probably good to have a couple of those. Um, those are schools where your GPA and test scores are in the 75th percentile of students that they've admitted in the past, where it would be incredibly unlikely for this institution to not accept you. Um, as a general rule, those are schools you know you can go to. But whether a school is a reach, a target, or a safety, academically or athletically, you still really want all those schools on the list to be schools where you would be happy going, um, where they have your major that you would enjoy, they have activities and other things that you want to participate in. Um, I don't recommend applying to a safety school because you know you'll get in if you'll be miserable there, because there are other safety schools you can apply to that you would be much happier at. So those are kinds of things to consider. For the athletes, athletically, if you 
participate in any of the recruiting profiles like NCSA and, you know, Connect WAC, Sports Recruits, uh, once you've been on long enough and you've submitted recruiting videos that they've reviewed, they will actually give you a sense of how you compare athletically to what those coaches are recruiting for. So that gives you a real sense of, is that school athletically a reach for you? Is it a target for you? Is it a safety school for you? Uh, so that's another thing that students can look at with the recruiting profiles. Without the recruiting profiles, it's really hard. You're just sort of guessing. Um, it is safe to say though, for example, a school like Maryland, um, lacrosse-wise, that's one of those schools that's pretty much a reach school for everyone <laughs> because they have their choice of lacrosse athletes from all over the country and they don't take that many. So you can be the best lacrosse athlete in your state and Maryland is still a reach school for you. So it's kind of one of those things, doesn't mean don't apply, um, but just kind of keep that in mind. Schools like that will always be a reach athletically. Um, for your recruiting profile, and I really recommend if you decide you want to play lacrosse in college. If you don't already have a recruiting profile, build one as fast as you can. It doesn't matter if it's NCSA or Connect Lax or Sports Recruits or Captain U or there, there are others. Those are the biggest ones. Um, it doesn't matter which one you pick really. You can look at them all. Most of them allow free options um, as well as paid options where you get more support, but you can kind of play around and put a free profile in a couple of them and figure out what you like best and then decide what you want to keep or not. But the recruiting profiles are great because you can just send the link to your recruiting profile to coaches and they see all kinds of information about you. They can communicate with you through the profile, but they can get to know you better as an athlete through the profile where you're not constantly trying to inundate them with emails um, or you're not trying to send one really long email telling them everything about you. Uh, that tends not to work so well. Coaches are really busy. They're not going to read a, an email that would print out to three pages. Um, there are some important things you want to put in the recruiting profile. Now, every service is different, but for most of them, the items in yellow, the high school, the GPA, the height and weight, and your primary position in your sport, for most of the recruiting profiles, those things you have to put in before any coaches can see your profile. So don't go into a profile and just sort of put in your name and then you play lacrosse and leave the rest blank. Coaches won't see you. So at least put in that basic information so they know what your position is, what your GPA is, and the coaches really care. They want that information. Um, it, women's lacrosse is a little different. Um, you know, the men's money-making sports like football or basketball, your GPA can be less than ideal um, and significantly lower than the average student body for colleges you're interested in. But because those sports make money, if you're good enough, um, you might get some exceptions. Um, as a general rule, women's sports don't make money. So coaches want to know right away, does your GPA fit in the range of GPAs that their school accepts? Um, if it's a really highly selective school academically and they only accept students with 3.8 GPAs and higher, they really kind of want to know if you have a 2.2 GPA up front so that they're not wasting their time or yours. So it's important to put that in there. And that's not to scare kids off. There are tons of schools where you do not have to have a 3.8 GPA to get in, but it's important to be targeting the right schools and for them to know the right students for them so that you're not wasting a whole bunch of time bugging a coach when there's just no way you're gonna be a good fit for their institution. Um, transcripts and test scores. If you are a freshman or a sophomore, no one expects test scores on your profile um, because as a general rule, sophomores, freshmen, they're not taking the SAT or the ACT yet. If you're a senior and you've got a recruiting profile and you don't have test scores in there, 
it's a red flag for coaches because they're wondering why you don't have test scores in there. Um, so the older you get, juniors, it's kind of hit or miss because most students take those exams starting in their junior year. But as soon as you have test scores, you should put them in there. Coaches are more likely to pay attention to your profile and look at it if you have your transcripts and test scores in there. Um, if you're worried about it, those things are locked down. So the college coaches can go in and see your transcripts and see your test scores. The general public cannot see that information. So there will be some things about your profile that's public, like your name and your high school and what sport you play, but no one will see your transcripts except the college coaches. So that's something you can kind of feel safe about. It, that's not publicly posted. Um, but the college coaches want to see that. So if you've got transcripts or test scores, put them in there, whatever profile you're using. Um, the highlight video is really important. Coaches look at profiles with highlight videos much more often than they look at profiles without a highlight video. If I know it's really weird with COVID right now and so many tournaments getting canceled and it's hard for kids to practice and those kinds of things. If you have a highlight video, put it on your profile. If you don't have a highlight video, it's totally okay to grab a friend, run through some backyard drills, have a parent film it on their iPhone. You can kind of play around and cut it a little bit to get good clips. Post that temporarily until you've got a better highlight reel but at least that gives them a sense of what your skill level might be. And there's something for them to look at to attract their interest. Um, eventually you want a better highlight video of game film, but if you, if you don't have that right now, um, put up what you can because the coaches will look at that and it will at least give them a sense of what your skill level is. Um, something else to think about your highlight video doesn't have to be perfect. Don't worry that um, you don't have enough clips that show college level skill. The truth is college coaches don't expect you as a high school athlete to have college level skill. What they're looking for is what is your current skill level? If you've put up multiple videos over time, so if you put up a video as a freshman, and then you put up a sophomore highlight video and you put up a junior highlight video. What they're expecting to see is that you're better your junior year than you were your freshman year. So they want to see your current skill level. They want to see some level of improvement over time. And they want, they're looking for potential. Do you have the potential for them to help turn you into the college athlete they need you to be? They don't expect you to be a college level athlete as a high school student. They really don't. It's unrealistic. They know it but they're looking for that potential. So give them what you can, and then just keep improving it as you can. And by all means, if you put up what you can now and you have a really good season and you get some film, get that new stuff up as fast as you can. Don't take the old stuff down. Label it from the year it was, put the new stuff up with the new year, let the coaches see the progression because they really do like to see that you have improved. Um, a personal statement. Believe it or not, every one of the recruiting profiles has a place for a personal statement. Some of them limit you to 250 words. Some are like five, six, 700 words. Others will let you rant on and on for however long you want. Um, but if you have a personal statement, coaches are much more likely to look at your profile. Um, and we'll talk a little more about personal statements later and then the next workshop we're doing in a couple weeks is actually really specific to personal statements because they're really important, not just for a recruiting profile, but when you apply to colleges, you've got to lock that down. Um, you need a really good personal statement, especially if you're applying to really selective institutions. Um, put events and activities in your recruiting profile. So if you're going to lacrosse camps and tournaments and those kinds of things, put them in there. So coaches can see that you have attended certain events or you're going to upcoming events. So they know that if they're going to be there, they can look for you there and watch you play. Um, the highlight videos are great. Coaches need them. Coaches do not recruit girls they've not seen in person. They just don't. 
if there's a highlight video though that they like and you're going to a tournament they'll be at and especially if you've been communicating with them they'll watch you at the tournament but they do like to see the girls play in person so tell them where you're going to be so they can watch you um, put in what lacrosse clubs you play for in addition to your high school and who your coaches are um, it's a red flag if you list your clubs on your recruiting profile and you don't list your coaches um, college coaches look at that and wonder why are you afraid for them to call your coach um, and you shouldn't be um, coaches expect to be listed on those profiles it's certainly polite and respectful to let your club coach know um, and if you if you've had some turnover with club coaches if there's like a club administrator or something that you can list um, it, it's polite to give them a heads up and say hey I've I'm building this recruiting profile. I'm listing you as my coach or program administrator or whatever it is. So they know um, they expect it. I've not yet ever come across a coach for high school kids who doesn't expect that they're going to be listed and that they might get a call or an email from a college coach. Um, if you have a club coach and you want to list them on the recruiting profile and you give them a heads up and they say, absolutely not. Um, what I would say to you is maybe rethink why you are playing for a club with a coach who won't assist you um, by spending two minutes on the phone with a college coach to give you a recommendation. Um, but that's a whole other problem entirely. I've generally not seen that happen. So, um, so with the NCSA profiles, the coaches can pretty much see everything you put up there. Um, they one of the things they don't see though is on the ncsa profile you can rank order colleges of interest they will see that you've indicated interest they will not see their rank so you don't have to worry about that you don't have to worry that you've ranked some college 25th and that the coach is going to see that and lose interest in you so they'll see pretty much everything you see they'll also see if you have put up highlight videos ncsa will evaluate um, how you fit athletically with what they're looking for and if you've put up transcripts and test scores how you fit academically with what they're looking for and so coaches will see that comparison um, and then they'll see, like I said, if you indicated that you're interested in that school, they will not see where you ranked them. Um, and most of the recruiting profiles, those services kind of work the same way. So the coaches pretty much see all the information you put up. They see if you've expressed interest. They do not see if you've expressed interest in other schools and they don't see how you've ranked them compared to other schools. So you don't have to worry about that. If you rank schools in order of preference for your own use, the coaches will not see how they rank. Um, they can find profiles by searching NCSA. If you're on Connect Lack, Sports Recruits, whatever, they, they can search that way. Um, coaches can search by um, GPA. They can say, I'm, I want kids with a 3.0 GPA or higher. And they can see a ton of profiles that come up 3.0 or higher. They can say, I'm only looking for goalies. And they can just see goalies. They, and they can search. Um, by school, all kinds of things. Um, but they can search NCSA and find you. Um, the NCSA service has a recruiting team that helps match players to coaches. Um, a lot of the other profiles have, uh, pro the services have similar matching services for coaches. Uh, but NCSA will actually let coaches know if they think you're a good fit for them. And also if you email the coach, and that's a really good way to get their attention. Email the coach, give them the link to your recruiting profile, and they'll find you that way they can look at your profile. Um, one of the handouts for tonight is kind of some sample emails to see how to reach out to coaches. Um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So questions come okay. up is 
what's on the NCSA part of the page version? So it what you get depends on how much you pay. The difference between the couple of paid tiers tends to be more. Um, you can post more videos or they will produce more videos for you or they will do more one on one individual sessions with you to help you narrow down colleges, that kind of thing. Um, what most of the services do like NCSA and sports recruits. Um, if you want to be able to use their system to email coaches through the system instead of emailing them separately, you usually have to pay for that. Um, in some cases, NCSA and sports recruits both do this. If you have a free service, you cannot see which colleges have looked at you. If you have paid, you can see which colleges have looked at you. That having been said, um, if you're a freshman or a sophomore, honestly, I don't know that you necessarily need to pay because D3 schools might be seriously looking at you as a general rule, D1 and D2 schools aren't, they can't even talk to you. Um, if you reach out to them, you're gonna get a form email. That's all you're gonna get because they're not allowed to talk to you. Um, so do you wanna pay, do you not wanna pay? For most of those services, they do offer a one-time fee that's good until you're out of high school and recruited. So if you want to just pay the one-time fee and not have to worry about it and you pay it early so you see more information, great. If you don't, wait. Um, so that's kind of one of the things. Um, also for a number of the services, you can't necessarily see your athletic evaluation until you've paid. Coaches will see it, but you won't. So it's those kinds of little differences. Um, if you're a junior or senior, you get more benefit out of a paid service because you can see which coaches are looking at you. You can see how you compare athletically and academically to help make decisions and you're closer to a point where you have to make those decisions. But again, it's still not necessary. The truth is if you have a free NCSA profile and you have emailed I'll, I'll pick on Maryland again because Kathy Reese has her pick of players. And you've emailed Maryland six times a year for the past three, four years, and all you've ever gotten back is a form email. You don't need to know that she's not ever looked up your profile. It, she's already made that crystal clear. Because if she was interested in you as a player, at some point in those many years of you emailing her repeatedly, you would have gotten some sort of personal email back. Some sort of, great, I'll see you at such and such tournament. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have that information. Um, whether you're getting emails from coaches or not, kind of tells you whether or not they're interested. Um, and were there other questions? Okay, so we can. We'll go to the next. Um, so a little bit of information on some of the things you want to put on your profile. So as soon as you can get a highlight video up, get one up there. Again, if you don't have game footage, backyard drills, it's better than nothing. Put it up until you have something better. Um, your highlight video should be about three to five minutes in length. If you've gone over five minutes, no one's watching. Like if you put up a 10 minute highlight video, coaches have stopped watching around the three or four minute mark. So don't waste your time it, putting in all that effort, finding all those clips. Um, most coaches will watch about three minutes. They might go a little longer if it's really good. Um, I wouldn't go over five minutes. They're, they're gone by then. They shut it off, they're done. Um, you want your best plays and you want them in order. So your very best plays, those are the first ones you put in your highlight reel and then they get progressively not so great. But you want to get the most attention from the most coaches as fast as you can. So your absolute best plays, best drills, best whatever it is, that's what's going first. Um, 
I don't care what position you play, your highlight reel should show both offense and defense. And um, I've had girls tell me, I've even had goalies tell me, well, I'm a goalie, I don't play offense. Um, if you've ever saved a ball and you've had to clear, you absolutely do play offense. And if you don't play, if you don't know you play offense, that's something you don't want to share with college coaches um, because you do play offense. The minute you clear a ball, that's offense. And you need to show that you can not just make saves, but you can make good clears. Um, if you're a defender and you check someone's stick, you get the ground ball, you're now on offense. I don't care if you're on the defensive end of the field, you're on offense. Um, so you don't, as a defender, you don't want a highlight reel that's just you coming up good body position on a girl or check after check after check and they never see what happens after that. Um, coaches kind of want to know. If you got that ground ball, did you manage to successfully pass it away? Those kinds of things. So show your defensive skill and your offensive skill. If you play mostly attack, um, yeah, they want to see goals and assists. But again, if your team loses the ball, if their goalie makes a save, are you redefending? And coaches want to see that. How are you handling that? Because that is part of your job on the attack end of the field. So coaches don't want to just see goal after goal after goal after goal and nothing else. Um, if you're a midfielder, that's one of the tougher ones because there's a tendency for midfielders to have a whole highlight video of nothing but goals and assists or a few ground ball pickups, but it tends to be all offense. If you're a midfielder and you're wanting to get recruited as a midfielder, college coaches expect you to play offense and defense and they expect you to play a lot of both. So you need to make sure your highlight reel also shows your skill on the defensive end of the field. It can't just be offense. So I can't stress it enough, no matter what position you play, you've got to show both, both offense and defense. Um, as much as possible, show varsity games, show good club footage. Again, COVID has completely screwed everything up for everyone. Um, but if you're just getting into high school and you don't have a highlight reel, or you haven't had a chance to do one yet, do the best you can with backyard footage. Um, you don't have to put music in a highlight video. Um, some coaches like music, some coaches don't. Um, a lot of coaches, if they don't like music, they'll just mute while they listen, while they watch your highlight reel. So it's not that big of a deal. But if you do take the time to put music in your video, it's gotta be appropriate music. Nothing with profanity, inappropriate words, references. I, I, we shouldn't have to say this, but um, I've heard from college coaches that there were kids they were interested in and their highlight video had a song in the background that had the N-word and they just got crossed off the coach's list immediately and they were done. It, no more interest. So just be really, really careful. If you put in music, make sure it's appropriate. If you're not sure, just don't do it. The game background noise, totally fine. No, no sound at all, also fine. Um, do a personal statement on your recruiting profile as soon as you reasonably can. Um, and what I will say about that though is don't just throw something up just to have a personal statement. Again, we're doing a workshop that will really help kids build a good personal statement. Um, it'll be longer on your actual college applications, but for a recruiting profile, just a couple of paragraphs, a few sentences. It doesn't have to be really long. Um, but the point of the personal statement is to let the coach know who you are as a person. So don't put your transcripts and test scores and all those other things on the profile and then write a personal statement telling coaches what your GPA and test scores are. They already know that. You've already put that on your profile. You don't need to tell them again. Um, what you want to do is tell them things about yourself that they can't find anywhere else on your profile. So um, if you have something in particular that's a hobby that you absolutely love, 
it's totally okay in your recruiting profile to tell them about that. Um, it's even better if you can tie it into how that helps you with lacrosse. But you want to tell them things about you that aren't necessarily obvious from the other things in your profile. Um, you want to share things about you that, that you're good at, um, things that you value, what your priorities are, those kinds of things. I would say, especially the younger you are, you don't want to be too specific. Um, I would not say, for example, in a recruiting profile, in your personal statement, that you absolutely must play D1 lacrosse at an ACC school because you have now just seriously limited what coaches are willing to look at you. Because if you've said that, you've just eliminated a huge number of schools where coaches don't want to waste their time because you've made it really clear you're not interested. So you might want to say something if you're talking about your personal interests or academic interests, you, it's totally okay to say you're interested in going to a school with a really strong marketing program because there's a bunch of those. You're not eliminating the majority of schools in the country. Um, it's okay to say you're interested in going to an academically selective institution. Um, and sure, there are some state schools that aren't very selective that will ignore you, but if you're really not interested, there are enough academically selective schools that you haven't totally limited your pool of interested coaches. Um, so don't be too specific. Um, even if your goal is you are just dying to play for Kelly Amante Hiller at Northwestern, don't say that in your personal statement because that's just a you know slap in the face to every other really good coach and program out there. And they're not going to necessarily have a whole lot of interest if you've outright said, yeah, I'm not interested in you. Um, be honest um, about who you are as a person and a player. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if you post a highlight video that's three minutes of you take the draw, you win the draw, you run and you shoot and score. You take the draw, you win the draw, you run, you shoot and score over and over and over again. And then your personal statement says, I'm a team player. What you have just told every college coach in the country is either I am dishonest or I have no self-awareness. So be really honest about who you are as a player. If you are the player that every single time you get the ball has to shoot and score, then you say something in your personal statement like you are very aggressive offensively. It's true. And there are coaches that love that. Um, but don't say I have, I'm really proud of the fact that I have as many assists as I have goals. If all you're showing in a highlight video is goal after goal after goal, and there's not a single assist in your highlight reel. So just kind of be careful about that. You want to make sure that what you're saying about yourself in your personal statement and everything else you're showing coaches about yourself matches so that there's not that disconnect because that really concerns coaches. If they're seeing two very different things, then they have no idea. They're wondering who is this person? Um, communicating with coaches. So that's another one. So again, if you hadn't yet registered and you got the Zoom link, just go in and register so we can send you the handouts. But there are some in the handouts, some kind of sample emails to give you an idea of how you might introduce yourself to a coach, um, what you might send them before a tournament or camp, what you might send them afterwards. Um, so the samples are kind of a good idea to give you a sense of how you might professionally approach communicating with the coach. Don't copy and paste it exactly. Um, because pretty much if everyone copies and pastes exactly, then coaches get dozens, hundreds, thousands of identical emails and you don't stand out. So kind of personalize it for yourself, whatever works for you. But you want to introduce yourself to the coaches. Tell them a little about yourself. Um, one of the things I will say, my, my daughter and I kind of jokingly refer to it as a Molly moment. But um, one of the things we always worked on is absolutely make sure 
check and double check and triple check. Have a friend or family member check. Before you hit send, make sure you have the correct coach name and the correct school name. Because the worst thing is to send an email, you know, like Coach Amy Bacher, who's at Ohio State now, the last thing you want to do is send her an email telling her how great Stanford is. She doesn't coach there anymore. That It's horrible. So you don't want to have that. And my daughter and I joke around and call it a Molly moment because we've worked really hard with her coach communications to make sure that doesn't happen. She actually had a really good phone call with a coach. And the next day the coach sent her an email thanking her for the call. And it started out dear Molly. And that's not my daughter's name. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing both ways. So you don't want your Molly moment. Make sure you are addressing the correct coach you're naming the correct school. Um, what I would say to you, I don't care how informal a coach is, always make sure the email is addressed to coach so-and-so. Um, I Don't leave out the coach. Um, and even if that coach happens to be really good friends of your parents and you've known them since you were six years old, you still address them as coach whoever in the email. Um, but again, can't stress it enough. Make absolutely certain the coach's name is correct and the school's name is correct because no one wants an email that um, was just copy and pasted a million times and you've accidentally named the wrong college. Um, that lets them know you're not really interested enough to put the time and effort into your communication. Um, and some coaches are... Um, less forgiving than others about that, but there are coaches that will just automatically cross you off any potential interest list because you clearly didn't put in the effort that they're looking for. Um, social media. So it's okay to share with coaches um, things like your Instagram information, Twitter, anything you're on. What I would say to you though before you do that is make sure you have absolutely cleaned it up. Look at who you're friends with and what their sites look like, you know, what you're following, all those kinds of things, but make sure there's nothing in your social media that you would not want your grandma to see before you share it with coaches. And keep in mind too that when you reach the point in your senior year where you're ready to apply to colleges and universities, the more selective institutions do check your social media. So it's better to just make sure it's all cleaned up and good to go now because the admissions committees are going to be looking at it. And um, there are athletes and non-athletes who admissions committees have seen their social media and not admitted them because of it. And there have been students who have been admitted and their admissions have been rescinded because of things they've done on social media. So I would just say be very careful with that. And the grandma rule is a good one. If, if you've got something on your social media that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see, it doesn't need to be there. Because um, coaches don't want to see it either. And admissions committees don't want to see it. Um, it's okay to give a coach your phone number if you're comfortable having a phone call with them. Um, and for many of you at some point, coaches will want to talk to you on the phone. If, um, if you're not yet a junior, NAIA and D3 coaches can talk to you anytime. So you might as a freshman or sophomore get some calls and have some conversations with D3 and NAIA coaches. Um, the D2 coaches will not talk to you until June 15th after your sophomore year, right at the end of your sophomore year. Um, so if you're at that point, that's when you might start getting some calls from D2 coaches. Uh, D1 coaches, September 1st is still the date, September 1st of the junior year. So if you're a junior, you might start getting calls from D1 coaches after September 1. Um, so if you're comfortable talking with coaches on the phone, and at most point, for most players at some point, Coaches who are interested in you will want to have some phone conversations. So if you're comfortable giving them your phone number, do, but make sure it's a phone where voicemail is set up and your voicemail, if you're unavailable to answer, is professional. So 
again, nothing you wouldn't want your grandmother to hear if they call you. Um, in-person official visits, you can do, um, that's more of a D1 thing. Typically your senior year, you can do up to five of those. Um, unofficial visits, you can do an unlimited amount. Official visits, the college invites you and they pay for it. Unofficial, you're on your own dime. You can go and visit colleges, talk to coaches, those kinds of things. Um, don't ask colleges for official visits. If they're interested enough, they will invite you. Um, and parents, you should not be emailing coaches, asking them if they're interested in your kid or asking them to invite your kid to campus, those kinds of things. Um, the athletes should be communicating with the coaches. At some point, if the athlete's interested in the school and the coach has an interest in the athlete, they might do some campus visits, those kinds of things, phone calls where they, the coach wants the entire family or the parents on the call or at the visit, um, totally fine. And it's fine for parents at that point to be asking questions of the school. Um, but initially, especially if your kid's a freshman, please don't be calling or emailing D1 coaches saying, hey, please come look at my kid. They're not. And they've got so many kids emailing them, they don't have time to deal with parents of a kid they can't recruit for two years. It's, it's just, they don't have the time for it. So this is my recommendation for emails. And some kids like to do a paid service with the recruiting services and email through the service. And if that works for you, great. Um, if you're not paying for a service or if quite frankly, you don't like the internal email, some kids don't like it, um, set up an email that's recruiting dedicated. So you might already have a school email or you might have your own Gmail account or whatever. My recommendation is to set up a free email account that you use for nothing but recruiting that you are gonna check every single day. Once you start communicating with coaches and you give them your email, you need to check that email every day. Only takes a few minutes, but the last thing you want is to email a coach and tell them you're really interested in their school and then not ever check your email and you go in a month later and realize they emailed you back right away and you ignored them for a month. So just make sure whatever email you're using, once you give it to coaches, you're checking every day and then it's easier if you do use a recruiting only dedicated email because that way you don't get a bunch of spam mixed in there. You don't get all kinds of other emails from friends and family where you miss that coach email buried in a stack of emails. Um, my recommendation, because it's easy for coaches then to know where you're at in the recruiting process and what kinds of communication they are and are not allowed to have with you is to just do first name, last name, grad year at whatever. So, you know, Jane Smith 2022 at gmail.com. It's really easy. The coach knows your name. They know what year you're at and where you're at in the recruiting process. And so they know that right away. Um, and then in terms of keeping track, I recommend you start tagging or folders for every college and coach and start, you, you email a coach. If they respond to you, have the appropriate communication back and forth, file it all in one place where it's easy for you to find and refer to. Um, if you do use like NCSA or Sports Recruits internal email systems, they do some tracking for you. Um, so if that works for you, if that paid service and you like the email system and it works for you, great. If it doesn't, it's okay to use whatever outside email. That's totally fine. But just have a way to organize it and make sure you're checking it every day. And then again, social media, we talked about this sort of already. Just make sure before you're giving coaches any kind of social media stuff um, that you've got it cleaned up. Even if you're not giving them your social media information, I'd still recommend once you wanna start getting recruited, double check and make sure it's clean um, because they might look and find you anyway. Um, and for some of you, if you're thinking, yeah, I never post anything inappropriate, it's totally fine, I'm not worried. 
but you have a friend on social media and their stuff shows up in your feed and they're constantly posting stuff that makes you cringe. Um, that's a problem because coaches are wondering, why are you following this person? Why are you friends with this person? Because they might see that stuff when they start checking your social media. So if you're one of those people and a few of us have that friend that posts things that make us cringe, um, in the recruiting process, you might not want that friend to be your friend on social media. Um, we have a question going back to the uh -huh. email name. The uh, question is, do you recommend using your legal first name or a shortened first name, or does it matter? It doesn't really matter. Um, what I would say is, however you're going to introduce yourself to coaches and what you typically go by is probably the best thing to use. Um, because that's what you're going to have coaches call you anyway. So then that's the name they see and they know that's you. Um, yeah, if you have a nickname that you use all the time, that's totally fine. It doesn't have to be your full legal name kind of situation. Um, okay, so we can go on because we're sort of done with the social media deal. Um, once you start communicating with coaches, it's really important to remember um, as you start scheduling phone calls with coaches, um, especially the younger you are, they don't necessarily expect you to be completely polished in a phone call, but they do expect you to be professional and take it seriously. So think of your phone call with a coach like a job interview and it starts at the beginning of the call. So if you know a coach is calling you at a specific day and time, when they call, you don't want to pick up the phone. Yo, you know, just, I've seen it happen. Don't do it. You want to be professional from start to finish with the call. When the call is over, make sure you say thank you to the coach for their time. You don't want to just say, okay, yeah, bye. It, you know, make sure at some point at the end of the call, you have thanked them for their interest in you. Um, Try, if you can, as much as possible to go somewhere free of distractions so you don't have little brothers and sisters annoying you all the time while you're trying to talk to a coach. Um, make sure you're prepared and you have some questions that you're going to ask them. Because if you're reaching out to a coach and you're communicating with them and you're telling them you're interested in their school and they make the effort to schedule a phone call with you and they ask you, do you have any questions for me? And your response is, nope. Um, it's not a good look. They're wondering, are you really interested in my school? Do you not know anything about this program or the school? You don't have a single question for me. Um, so, so ask questions. Um, and there are all kinds of things you can ask. Um, you can ask things like, um, what are their goals for the team for the next year? Um, you know, how did they get into coaching? It, there are all kinds of things. Um, if you're interested in a very specific major, you can ask them, hey, how many accounting majors have you had on your team? Uh, there's a million questions you can ask a coach that are appropriate. But um, my advice, because kids, especially when you first start having phone calls with coaches and you're new to it, you, you get nervous. You can't help yourself. Um, think of questions in advance. Write them down. So that that way, you, if, if the conversation kind of comes to a lull or if the coach asks you, do you have any questions, that's the time you can look at your list and you can ask the coach some of those questions. Um, so write some down in advance so that you're not sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I thought of 10 questions and now I can't think of any of them. Write them down. It's, you know, you're on the phone, coach isn't going to see you. And quite frankly, even with video calls, um, if you've written down questions to ask a coach and they see you looking at your list, it tells them you're prepared. It's not a turnoff to a coach. They think, okay, this person actually made an effort for this call. Um, so questions coaches might ask you that you want to be prepared for. Um, they're likely to ask you to tell them about yourself. Uh, so you want that the kind of 30 second, one minute elevator pitch, something you're going to tell them about yourself. Um, so be prepared for that because 
what happens often is a coach will say, tell me about yourself. And the kid will respond, well, what do you want to know? They want to know what you want to share with them. So tell them something about yourself, whatever it is. Um, and it can be something really serious, like, um, you know, you are determined to get through college with a 4.0 GPA and then go to grad school and be a human rights attorney. Or you can tell them something really funny, like, you know, you're obsessed with K-pop. It, you know, but tell, have something to tell them about yourself. Um, just make sure it's not something um, that's politically sensitive, religiously sensitive, offensive, but pretty much anything else is fair game as long as it's legitimately true about yourself. And, um, you know, go ahead and share it if it's something you're comfortable with. Um, they will ask you often, coaches will ask you, what are your strengths? They don't necessarily mean what are your strengths on the lacrosse field. So you can tell them something you're really good at on the lacrosse field. I'm great at ground balls. Um, but you can also tell them things like, I'm awesome at history, w whatever it is. You know, I won an award for mountain biking, I, you know, whatever it is. But they're looking for things that you're good at, that you care about, that you enjoy. Um, a lot of coaches will ask you what your weaknesses are. Um, that can be a minefield. What, what happens is, and this is kind of a job interview problem too, um, people are asked what their weakness is and what they've often been coached at is, oh, pick something that, you know, you act like it's a weakness, but it's really a strength. So things like, well, say you're a perfectionist. That's kind of one of those things um, that people are often coached to do. The problem when you answer those questions that way is coaches or employers know when you say that, that either you're not being honest with them about what your weaknesses are, or again, you really are a perfectionist, but you don't quite realize that that is in fact an actual weakness, that it's not the strength you think it is, that there are things that are not so great about being a perfectionist. So if coaches ask you about your weaknesses, what you want to do is pick a legitimate weakness you have and tell the coach what it is and tell them things you've done to overcome it. So um, it can be anything like, I, I struggle in science labs. And so what I've done is I've gone extra, I spent extra time tutoring with my science teacher, I found a really good lab partner who will work with me, whatever it is, but give them an actual weakness. Tell them how you're working to overcome that, things you've done to improve it, to do better, get around it, whatever it is. You just want to make sure the weakness you pick is not a deal breaker. So for example, um, if a coach asks you your weaknesses, things like I'm not a team player, <laughs> is not a good answer because um, that's kind of one of those things where for most coaches, that's a deal breaker um, where the fact that, you know, you go to the writing center every time you have to turn in an essay because you struggle with writing essays, not a deal breaker. They're not interested in your essay writing ability. What they want to know is, are you aware of your strengths and weaknesses and what do you do to deal with that? It, it's kind of like if you're in a job interview to, be a pediatric nurse. You don't want to tell people your weaknesses that you have no patience for children. You know, pick, pick a different weakness, any other weakness, um, and, and tell them how you've overcome it. Um, they might ask you about your academic goals. The more academically selective a college is, the more likely a coach is to ask you about your academic goals. Um, and they might ask you what you're looking for in a team or a coach, and, and they want to know. And what I would say to you is, don't tell the coach what you think they want to hear. Be honest with them about what you're looking for in a team or a coach if that's what they ask you. It may be that they're not a good fit for you and you're not a good fit for them, but be honest, find it out sooner rather than later. Um, if you're honest with these coaches and you have a good relationship, you might reach a point where they realize you're not a good fit for them, but coaches talk to each other. So there might be a coach who their attitude with their team is 
you know what, we don't expect to win any championships. We're all just here for fun while we go through school. And you're really serious about wanting to be on a team that is athletically very competitive, no matter, you know, whatever division they're in or conference they're in. Um, so that coach isn't a good fit for you. But if you're honest with them, they might a few weeks later be at some event talking to their friend, the coach of whatever other institution that is super competitive athletically. And they might say to that coach, and they do talk to each other. They do say these things. They might say to that coach, hey, I've been talking to this girl. She's really great. She's interested in a way more competitive program than ours. Have you seen her? Have you talked to her? So be honest with the coaches. Be straightforward. Figure out where you fit and where you don't as fast as you can. Um, but whether you find a school a good fit or not, be polite, be respectful, say thanks. Um, if you reach a point where you realize the school's not a good fit for you, it's okay to tell the coach that you, you know, changed your mind on your major and you've come to realize the school isn't a good fit for you, whatever it is, but be honest with them. Um, don't kind of drag them along because then they're telling other coaches, this kid let me believe that we were her top choice for six months and she's not interested. So don't do that because they do tell other coaches and it's a red flag to other coaches if that kind of thing happens. We'll skip this next slide because we already talked a little bit about the kind of class, the kind of questions you might ask coaches. Um, if you get the opportunity to meet with coaches in person, and this is whether you're invited to campus officially, whether you're going on officially, you talk to them for a few minutes at a tournament, you see them at a camp or clinic, whatever it is, Keep this in mind, the entire interaction, again, is like a job interview. The minute you get off the plane or you step on campus for their clinic or whatever it is, you are interviewing for a job. Um, and that job is to be a player on their team. But, but it's a job interview. So when you're hanging out with other kids at the camp or clinic and the coaches are, you know, kind of off wherever, um, just keep in mind, coaches are paying attention, even if they're not directly interacting with you, and they're watching how you interact with other girls. Um, they're watching how you kind of behave when you're sitting off by yourself or whatever it is. So if the coaches are 10 feet away and you're sitting with some friends and you're bad-mouthing some girl on your club team, it's not a good look. So just kind of remember, the minute you step on their campus, it's a job interview. You need to make sure you are on your best behavior and you are the kind of player and teammate that a coach would want to see. Um, if you're doing um, kind of a more formal official visit with a coach, you want to dress reasonably professionally. You don't have to full on, you know, go out and wear a suit sort of thing, but business casual-ish sort of professional um, to at least initially meet with them on campus. It's completely okay if you're setting up campus visits with coaches to ask them, am I going to get to work out with the team? You know, what kinds of activities will we be doing? And obviously, if you're going to be working out with the team, they expect you to be wearing athletic clothes and not to be dressed professionally and that sort of thing. But, but make sure you at least have something professional reasonably professional when you initially meet with them so they know you're taking the visit seriously. Um, if you're just going on to a um, college campus for a camp or a clinic, you don't have to dress up to show up. But, but if you're invited to an official campus visit, you want to at least look professional when you first meet with the coach. Um, again, when you talk to them in person, you want to ask them thoughtful questions about their coaching, about their college, about the team. It's okay to ask them, how many players do you have on your team? Um, it's okay to ask them um, how they manage playtime, those kinds of things. When you first start communicating with coaches, don't ask them about money. Just don't bring it up. At some point when you've had enough conversations with them, email, phone, meeting in person, whatever it is, and you're farther along in the recruiting process, and you're now at a point where they're serious, it's okay to talk about how they manage athletic scholarship money, 
does the school also help with academic merit money, need-based money, those kinds of things. Um, it's okay at some point once you've built the relationship to start having those questions, but in your first phone call or first meeting with a coach, you don't want to say, hey, how much money are you going to give me? Um, you kind of need to work up to that a little bit. And the same thing as a phone call, make sure you say thank you for their time and interest before you go away. Um, the last thing you want to do is do an official visit, spend two days on a campus that the coach has paid for, they have brought you and your parents out, and you don't say thank you. Um, another thing I will tell you all, so I've done a fair bit of work at ASU um, with athletes and things like that, and I've worked with Charlie Turner, who's an amazing basketball coach at ASU, and she's in a position with ASU's D1 basketball program that there are thousands more girls that want to come play for her than she has spots. When she does visits with athletes and their parents, whether it's her going to their home or them coming to ASU, she's really open about how she can teach basketball, but she can't teach character. So she watches those girls, and a lot of coaches are like this, she watches those girls and how they behave with their parents. Are they respectful to their parents? Do they thank their parents? Um, or are they sarcastic and sniping at their parents off to the side? You know, if the parent asks the coach a question, is the daughter rolling her eyes? When those things happen, um, Coach Turner is really honest. She crosses them off her list and they're done. She'll never consider them again. She has way too many girls. She's not going to waste her time. So I would say to you when you do in-person visits, if your parents are around and they're invited, if your siblings are around and were invited and show up, all I can say is be on your best, most polite, most respectful behavior with absolutely everyone you interact with because there are coaches and the more selective the program, the faster they'll do it. They'll just write you off if your behavior is not what they would publicly like to see if you're wearing their uniform. A question. Uh -huh. Is it okay to ask how many other people that play your position that they're, that they're recruiting? Absolutely. So if, yeah, Repeat the, question. The, the question was, is, is it okay to ask a coach how many players of your position they're recruiting? And you'd want to ask that how many players of my position in my grad year, because it doesn't matter if you're a 22, it doesn't matter how many 21s they're recruiting. Um, but yes, it's totally okay to ask a coach how many players of my position in my grad year are you recruiting? It's also okay to ask a coach, where do you see me on your team? Because this actually happens a lot. There are a lot of kids at the high school level for example, play in midfield and a coach is looking at you and they're interested in recruiting you and they have no intention of playing you on the midfield. They fully intend to put you in their zone defense. That's where they see you. That's the skill set they like that they've seen on the field from you. So it's okay to ask them, where do you see me? And coaches will be honest and tell you, I'm putting you on defense and I will play you if that's, if they think you're good enough. They'll tell you, you'll get playtime right away, those kinds of things. It's okay to have those conversations with coaches. It's okay to ask them, um, especially early on when you're first starting to communicate with them, um, especially the younger you are, it's fine to ask a coach, what kind of skills are you looking for in a player at my position? Because, if, for example, midfield, the coach might tell you, so – you're a sophomore, it's a D3 coach, and you ask them, you know, what are you looking for in players in my position? And they, they tell you, I need girls who can really play the transition game. What that tells you then is if you want to play midfield, if you're interested in that school, you need to make sure you're working on your transition game because they're, they're telling you that's what they're looking for. So as a midfielder, if you're really interested in that school, you don't need to waste your time trying to have the most powerful shot on the team, the coach you really want to play for isn't looking for a kid with the most powerful shot on their team. They're looking for a girl who can play the transition game. 
So, but if you're going to ask coaches those questions, pay attention to their answer because it's going to tell you, are you, or are you not a good fit for them? Or what do I need to work on if I really want to play here? So NCAA registration. At some point, if you want to play in the NCAA, you have to register with the NCAA and they have to certify that you're okay to play. Um, if you're a freshman or sophomore, you don't have to worry about it. By the time you're a junior, especially if you want to play D1 or D2 lacrosse, you need to register. Um, it does cost about $100 to register with the NCAA. You go to ncaa.org. Um, if you need financial assistance, the NCAA does have financial assistance fee waivers, that kind of thing. But ideally by your junior year, you've registered. You need to send them your transcripts um, because they've got to look for core courses. They're going to look on your transcripts. You need to make sure you register with the NCAA and send your transcripts because they will look at your grades in core courses Core courses are things like English, math, science, um, world languages, history, those sorts of things. Um, they post a GPA SAT eligibility chart so you can see, again, the higher your grades, the lower your test score can be. To be eligible to play, that having been said, if you're looking at academically selective schools, you want your grades and your test scores to be high. So um, the lower your grades, the higher your test scores must be to be eligible to play. Um, and the NCAA will also verify your amateur status. For most athletes, that's not a problem. Um, but what I would say is if you get the opportunity and someone thinks it'll be, hey, really fun to have you do a commercial where you shoot a bunch of lacrosse goals and they pay you, don't do it. Um, that doesn't happen very often. But just be really careful. You're never paid for lacrosse. Um, because they do check your amateur status. And if you've been paid to play your sport, you can no longer compete in the NCAA. Now, right now, there's some fun stuff going on with athlete likenesses and whether or not athletes will ever get paid. And that's a whole other issue that is still being worked out. And it'll be years and tons of legal battles. The safest thing to do for now is to just make sure you maintain your amateur status so that that's never a problem for you. Question. Uh -huh. If you're a junior and haven't registered yet, you do that right away. Yes. So um, you, so if you're a junior and you haven't registered yet for the NCAA, yes, you should register as soon as possible. Again, um, if you need a fee waiver, reach out to them, and the NCAA will walk you through the process. If you don't, um, a year ago it was ninety-five dollars. I think it's about the same now. Um, but register as soon as you can. Um, also, as you start communicating with college coaches, many of them will ask you to fill out their interest form or their survey. All of those surveys will ask you, are you registered with the NCAA Eligibility Center? And if so, what is your number? So when you register, you get a number. Um, so the sooner you register and have a number, the sooner you can tell college coaches, yes, I've registered, this is my number because the coaches can check with the NCAA and verify that they've got your transcripts so far, that your grades look good, that you're not gonna have any eligibility problems. And the older you get, coaches really wanna start looking at that sort of thing. Um, so yes, if you are a junior or older and you have not yet registered with the eligibility center, sooner is better. Uh -huh. is getting paid to give lessons a violation. So if you mean, do you get a small stipend of money to, you know, help coach youth lacrosse? No, you're not being paid to play lacrosse. You're being paid a small stipend to coach children. And as a general rule, that's not a problem. So just don't get paid to play. Like my daughter's a junior official. So she goes out on the field and she gets paid to officiate kids lacrosse. Um, that's not a violation. It, she's an amateur. She gets paid to officiate. She's never been paid to play. So some key dates to keep in mind. So 
September 1st of the junior year is when D1 coaches can start talking to you. So if you're interested in D1 schools and you start emailing them and you're a freshman or a sophomore, all you're gonna get back are sort of form standard emails. Hey, thanks for reaching out. You know, we can't talk to you yet because you're not yet a junior. You know, please keep in touch and keep us posted. It, you know, you'll get some variation of that sort of totally generic email. It doesn't mean they're not interested in you. It just means they don't have time to bother because you're too young for them to recruit. It doesn't mean they'll never be interested in you, but you have to kind of expect. And so if you've got limited time, if you're a freshman, I wouldn't waste my time emailing, emailing a bunch of D1 coaches that you're not going to get anything back except form emails. Um, it, that's just kind of the way it is. Um, if you're a junior, once September 1st passes, or if you're a senior, D1 coaches can talk to you. Now, if they don't, if September 1st comes in a couple of days and you're a junior and you don't have, you know, 61 coaches calling you September 1st, it doesn't mean they're not interested. Um, it takes them a while to get through girls they're interested in. There's also, they might not have had a, really an opportunity to see you yet. It's okay to email them. It's okay to express interest. It's okay to reach out and tell them what tournaments you'll be at, where they might be, so they can look at you. So even if you don't get interest from D1 coaches right away in your junior year, it doesn't mean you never will. Just keep in mind, they might not have had a chance to see you yet. Just putting on one question, uh -huh. going back to the last one. Uh, what GPA are they looking for in weighted, unweighted, or core? Okay, so the question is, what GPA are they looking for, weighted, unweighted, or core? So most schools, when you apply, want both your weighted and unweighted GPA. The NCAA expects two things. They expect you to have a certain test score on a sliding scale relative to your unweighted GPA, but they're also looking at your core GPA. So that, and that's what they count most. So with the NCAA, they are most concerned about your GPA in core academic subjects. So if you're barely scraping by with a bunch of D's in math, but your GPA is higher because you took a ton of art classes and got A's in those, um, the NCAA is really looking at those core courses and you're gonna have to have higher test scores to be eligible to compete um, because they, really, uh, they don't really care about your grades in art and music and those kinds of things. Did we have any other questions? Okay, so for D2, again, um, at the end of your sophomore year, come June 15th, they can start talking to you. So if you're a freshman and you're reaching out to D2 coaches, expect the same thing, you're gonna get the form letter. They can't talk to you, they won't talk to you. Um, you'll, you'll get that kind of standard form email. Don't feel badly about it, it they just can't talk to you. Um, after June 15th of your sophomore year, they can start talking to you. Um, so as a general rule, once those dates pass, um, coaches can start holding actual recruiting conversations with you. Uh, so they can talk to you about what it's like to play at their program, whether or not they have any interest in you, those kinds of things. Um, for, for recruiting, excuse me, <clears throat> um, um, typically the coaches are limited to about one call a week with a particular player. So I'm gonna grab my water, guys. Um, So don't expect a coach to be talking to you three times a week because you're really interested in the school. It's not going to happen. Um, and quite frankly, they're so busy, you're not even going to get one call a week. But that's the max they can do. Um, they can, once you pass those dates, start making verbal offers. Um, something to keep in mind, if they make you a verbal offer, and you make a verbal commitment. It is a commitment. Um, while they can be broken, it's frowned upon. And you don't wanna make a verbal commitment to a coach if you're not sure that's where you wanna be. And then continue 
to try and get recruited at another institution acting as though you haven't made a commitment. So that's something that you just, if you're not sure, don't verbally commit. It's just the easiest way um, to avoid bad feelings. Um, once you hit the first day of classes, your senior year of high school, um, you can do official visits. Um, D1, you can only do five. D2, three, and AI, you can visit all you like. Um, for the 2019 graduating class, November 14th was when the signing period opened for official written contract commitments. For the 2020s, it was November 13th. This year, for the 2021s, it's right around the same time. So you can kind of anticipate for every year after that, it's going to be mid-November. Um, this year, who knows, the date might change slightly, just COVID, it screwed everything up. But odds are good, the date's still going to be around mid-November. Um, this is just something to think about. If you think a D1 coach is really interested in you, if they spend a lot of time talking to you when you go to their camps, those kinds of things, um, they can talk to you before September 1 of your junior year, but they can't call you to have a recruiting conversation. So if they're really interested, um, they could, for example, call your club coach and have a conversation. And your club coach could get in a room with you and your parents, and your club coach can call the D1 coach and put them on speakerphone with all of you, and you and the D1 coach can have a conversation. And that's completely legal. So if a D1 coach is really interested in you and they try and do that, it's okay. Um, but they can't call you directly and have these recruiting conversations. So that's kind of something to keep in mind. Um, the SAT, ACT. So that's one of those things where fall of your junior year, you need to really start looking at taking those tests. Um, if you're a senior and you haven't taken them yet, take one of them as fast as you can. Allow yourself time to study for it, but get that test in as soon as you reasonably can. Um, the NCAA for 2020s decided that they would waive the test requirement again because of COVID and a lot of the tests were shut down. Um, 2021s, it looks like the NCAA is saying we're not going to make you take the test, but a lot of the colleges will still require test scores. So take the test. Um, if you're a junior, start looking at those tests. Get registered, figure out which one or both you're gonna take. Um, every college is a little bit different. On the bright side, if you do end up having to take, say the SAT more than once, a lot of colleges will super score. So if you score higher on math the first time than the second, but higher on a verbal portion of the test, the second rather than the first, they will take your highest math score and your highest verbal score and add them together. So not every school does it, but a lot of them do. So that's kind of a good thing to keep in mind. Research your colleges, know which, what the policies are at the colleges you're interested in. Um, definitely prepare. There's a lot of great free prep stuff online, Khan Academy, a bunch of places. Yeah, you can pay Kaplan a bunch of money um, or Princeton Review, but you can also find a lot of free, really good test prep resources. Um, if you're interested in schools that will only take the SAT and you're also interested in schools that will only take the ACT, you're gonna have to suck it up and take both. Most colleges will take one or both. Um, so figure out which one you'd rather take and focus on that test, prep for that test, take that test, and don't worry about taking a bunch of different tests. Um, the FAFSA, this is kind of one of those things you want to keep in mind. Um, it opens October 1st of your senior year of high school, and that's been the case every year for decades. So odds are good even if you're a freshman, the date is still going to be October 1st by the time you're a senior. There's a lot of financial aid that colleges give out, that states give out, that have early deadlines. And the sooner you apply, 
the more likely you are to be eligible and considered for those financial aid awards. So what I would say to you is if you're a senior, mark it on your calendar on October 1st, sit down with your parents and fill out the FAFSA. It's the, the free financial aid, the federal free financial aid form. Um, so do that. Just type FAFSA in a Google search. Sit down with your parents October 1st, 2nd, 3rd, early. Fill that thing out and submit it. Um, different colleges, like I said, will give awards based on what you put in the FAFSA. Um, the sooner you do it, the more financial aid you're eligible for. So don't wait till May of your senior year. You'll have missed a lot of financial aid opportunities by doing that. Um, you can do an early estimator. There are all kinds of college cost estimators that you can put in that will give you a rough idea of how much you'll, your family will be expected to pay toward your college education. And that kind of gives you an idea of how much financial aid you might need. Um, one of the handouts um, that's really helpful to students if you're in one of the witchy wooey states and those are like um, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, California, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, it's like 10 states um, that participate in this program. Witchy is for grad education and WUI is undergrad education, but it's a Western Interstate Commission on Higher Ed. And for a lot of colleges and programs, you can get discounted tuition even if you go out of state. So for example, if you're an Arizona student and you go to school in Colorado, you pay less than out of state tuition. You pay slightly more than in-state in tuition, but you get a big tuition discount. Um, by being in one of the compact kind of member states. So um, you can look at that um, booklet that's part of the handouts that was emailed to you and see because you might be thinking, hey, this school in Colorado is pretty expensive and look and realize, wait a minute, it's part of this WUI program and it would barely cost more than going to NAU kind of thing. So definitely consider that sort of stuff. Um, and we will stop there. Do we have any last questions? So do that last slide and we'll do it real quick. Um, since we don't have any more questions, just keep in mind we've got more workshops that are on the website. Just go to southmountainlax.com slash college dash prep um, and you can register for other workshops. We'll talk more about financial aid. Um, personal statements and all those kinds of questions, essays you have to do in the application process. Um, we'll do more on personal branding, social media, all that stuff. Here's something to keep in mind here with the athletic scholarships. Um, lacrosse is an equivalency sport, not a headcount sport. So almost no one gets a full ride athletic scholarship. It doesn't happen. Um, what happens is the women's lacrosse coaches take what a full ride scholarship would be, multiply it by 12, that's how much money they have. And they divide it out however they need to among the players that are on the team and they're recruiting. So they might have a team of 40 kids and they're dividing that money up amongst 40 kids. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. But you might get very little athletic money at a school you're interested in, but that school might have fantastic need-based awards if they're very expensive or merit money where your total package ends up being really good where you don't pay a lot. What I will say, the NCAA right now, athletic money can be stacked with merit money. So stuff based on your grades. Right now, athletic money may not be stacked with need-based money. They are, the NCAA right now is reconsidering that. Um, so that's something else to think about. If you're interested in a very expensive school and they can offer you very little athletic money and it can't be stacked with need-based money, but that school is, for example, Yale, and they're willing to match 100% of your financial need on a need-based scholarship, take the need-based scholarship. You can still play lacrosse, but go there for free and don't get hung up on whether or not I got athletic money. Um, you know, it, 
So just kind of keep in mind what the final total package is. And again, we'll talk a lot more about that in the financial aid workshop in like three weeks, a month, something like that. Um, but anyway, if there are any other questions, I'll answer them real quick. Otherwise, we're kind of at the end of our time. Do we have any other questions? Uh, not quite. They can unmute though if they want. Okay. So, um, last call for other questions if anyone's got them. If not, um, go ahead. You can look at our website, register for other workshops. We'll talk more about all this other stuff. If you have any questions, um, southmountainlax at gmail.com. Just send a question. Oh, yeah. And last time, if you got the Zoom link but haven't registered and you want the handouts, go to our website and register so that I have your email to send you the handouts. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for being here and hopefully we'll see you again in a couple weeks.